please, 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 Lower so what, sorry? Lower lands of Freddie the song, saying somebody is not here. Okay. Who's not there? My son, he's alive, he's not here. Okay, take a breath. This is the devastating case of Logan Mwangi. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the first episode of Sunny's Mysterious Stories. Let me first introduce you to the star of the show and quite frankly my inspiration and the whole reason well mostly the whole reason why I started this channel in the first place. Everyone this is Sonny. Say hello Sonny. He's too interested in what's going on outside the window at the moment but this is my best fur friend in the world and yeah, that's all I can say. And me, I'm just known as Sonny's dad. So see you later. Bye bye. So this is a brand new channel where each week I hope I'm bringing you some of the absolute very best in true crime, both solved and unsolved, from around the world. I'm going to tell you about cases that hopefully you've never heard of before, or at least if you have, I hope to bring a somewhat different angle to it. So like I said, these cases will predominantly include stories of murder, love triangles, and of course some of the very worst serial killers that have ever stalked the planet. Sprinkled in with some of these stories will also be stories from the paranormal, so hopefully there will be a little something for everybody to go around. So if you like that sort of content, why don't you join me and Sonny every week, make yourself comfortable and join me on this little journey into the darker and stranger side of life. Also due to the graphic nature of today's particular story, I'd just like to say that viewer discretion is most definitely advised here as this video does unfortunately discuss the topic of a child's death and the physical and emotional assault of that child that you may find upsetting. If you think that this might be you, then perhaps you should click out of this video and hopefully I'll see you back here next week with another case that might be right for you. Just one other thing that I'd like to say is this. Over the last few years, I've watched my fair share of YouTube videos that cover the sort of content that I'm going to be covering and I've listened to those YouTubers talk about how difficult it can be for them to do the research that brings you, the viewers, the content that you watch. Well it wasn't really until I sat down to research today's story that I truly realised just what they meant. So I would really like to shout out those YouTubers and you know who you are and just tell you how much more I respect you and the work that you put into each video week in, week out. So let's not put this off any further. Here is the tragic, sad story of how Logan Mwangi lost his young, innocent life to the hands of monsters. Logan Mwangi was the smiling schoolboy with a cheeky grin brown curly hair and pure innocent eyes that posed for the camera. He always looked happy, like all children should look really, but the enduring image of Logan Mwangi hides the true horror of what went on behind closed doors. The lies, deception and stomach churning performances, because that's what they were, performances that were carried out by his immediate family in a bid to avoid justice, saw police officers make the traumatic and blood-curdling discovery of Logan lying pale, cold and alone in the water of the River Ogmore, dressed in nothing more than mismatched pyjamas. It was the emergency services that ended up providing Logan with more care and concern than he had received in the very long time when they fought to save his life. But sadly, that was all in vain. 
Logan had already died before he entered the river after having been carried there by John Cole, his mother's partner, from their house in the dead of night with the assistance of Cole's stepson, 13-year-old Craig Mulligan. Despite contempt and disdain with which murderers Cole, his mother Williamson and Mulligan treated a five-year-old child is utterly incomprehensible and begs the question of how this was allowed to happen. This is the story of how a little boy's life was cut short in the most horrifying and evil way by the very people he should have been able to trust. So the way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to tell you a little bit about all the main people who are involved in all of this, starting with little Logan. Logan was born on March 15th, 2016 in Bridgend and he was described as being a lovely little boy who was cheerful, chatty, polite, kind and caring. He suffered from a slight little stammer but other than that he was healthy. His father, Benjamin Mwangi, lived in Essex, but he had little contact with him during his life after Williamson and his father split up. As it turns out, she prevented him from seeing his son. Williamson and Logan visited Mr Mwangi in Essex in 2019, but this was sadly to be the last time that he would ever see his son alive. Logan's grandmother, Claire Williamson, also described her grandson as being the apple of her eye. She said that he was a very bright child and a joy to be around. He was thirsty to learn and she had spent a lot of time playing with him. Logan had a close relationship with his grandmother and would frequently have sleepovers at her house. But after the boy's mother's new man came into their lives, she began to see less and less of him until contact was permanently stopped. Logan's teacher at Tondu Primary School Catherine Richards said that Logan was a loving, kind little boy, that he loved school, had loved being in the outdoor classroom and would light up the classroom with his smile. Now we come to Logan's mother. And I might crucify this pronunciation, but here we go. Ang Harrod Williamson, 31, was born on March 16th 1991 in Essex. She received private primary school education and went to a public school until she was 16. In 2014 she was convicted of two charges of theft after misusing her mother's bank card and she was arrested for taking her mother's car but no charges were brought. So Williamson moved to Wales in 2015 when she fell pregnant with Logan so that she could live with her mother. During this time, Benjamin Mwangi remained living and working in Essex, but he was present at Logan's birth in 2016. After briefly moving back to Essex with Logan and Benjamin Mwangi, Williamson and her son soon returned to Bridgend and the couple split up. In 2017, she met and married Jordan Hunt, but they split up after Hunt was convicted of attacking her. Sounds like she has a great taste in men. Anyway, in 2019, she met and started a relationship with John Cole. They met each other at the railway in pub in Bridgen. After that, they started a relationship which Williamson described as perfect. She apparently had said that she desperately wanted a fairy tale family. I don't know what kind of fairy tales she's been watching, but she needs to change what she watches. Even Williams' own mother described her daughter as being a melodramatic person and that she was always over emotional but did say that they were the best of friends. Logan's teacher Miss Richards also said that Williamson was over emotional and could at times be over familiar and would be angry at stuff on a number of occasions. She was also described as being a needy person who liked being the centre of attention. So next up is Logan's, well he's not really even his stepfather, but I suppose you could call him that. John J. 
Cole, 40, was born on February 4, 1982 in Rugby in Warwickshire. It was later revealed he was a former member of the National Front and former friends and colleagues described him as very racist. His interests were playing late night gaming sessions on his Xbox and going to the gym. Oh, yeah, he, he didn't work. None of them did. I just thought I'd let you know that. Now, he already had several earlier convictions that dated back two decades. He was convicted of common assault in September 2002. In April 2003, he was convicted of assault occasioning actual bodily harm following a battery conviction in October 2004. Um, in March 2005, he was convicted of resisting or obstructing a constable. In April 2006, there was a conviction for possession of cannabis. In September 2007, he was convicted of intimidation of a witness, battery, blackmail and perverting the course of justice. He was also convicted of burglary, theft, handling stolen goods, going equipped for theft, taking a conveyance, possession of a bladed article, criminal damage, possession of cannabis and to throw it in there, resisting a police officer. So he was never going to win any awards for model citizen. They had lived in the Midlands before moving to Wales in 2017 for a fresh start. Probably caused too much trouble where he was, so he had to go to new pastures. Like I say, probably trying to put some distance between himself and all those criminal convictions. And now we come to the last of the major characters from this story, and that is Cole's first stepson, Craig Mulligan, who was shockingly only 14 at the time of Logan's death. Well, he was born on October 2nd, 2007 in Coventry. He was placed into care at the beginning of 2021 after his biological mother assaulted him and she was then later sectioned under the Mental Health Act. His natural father, who had remained absent throughout his life, sadly died in a car crash in 2012. Apparently, Cole has been said to be completely besotted with his stepfather and would do pretty much anything for him. Later on in the investigation, a dog tag was discovered by the police and on it it said, To Dad, Happy Father's Day, Love Craig. The tag didn't feature Logan at all. The teenager was described as a complex, troubled and violent boy who had achieved a green belt in Muay Thai, which includes forceful kicking and punching. He could also be manipulative, as well as known for using a baby voice when he got into trouble, hoping that it would make things easier for him. A teacher described him once when he attacked a fellow pupil without provocation. He said that Craig was literally jumping on another boy and pulling him to the ground by putting his arm around his throat. When he was asked why he had done that, all he could say was that he had been dared by another boy. It was also reported by a neighbour that he had pulled a little girl's feet from out under her, causing her to injure her face. A woman who had fostered Craig for a short time described him as having a desire for violence and said that on one occasion he had grabbed the family dog by its back legs and on another occasion he had sprayed deodorant into the pet's eyes. The foster mum said that the youth talked about the horror film series The Purge and said he told her that when the new film came out he was going to kill her, her husband, her daughter and their pet dog. A comment which naturally horrified her. The foster mum said she told the teenager's social worker about what the boy had said and this is so maddening, she just brushed it off. She acted as if it was nothing. The foster mother's daughter described how Craig had tried to get her young nieces to play a murder game and told them he would put them in black bags. That is not right. In the week running up to Logan's murder, Mulligan made repeated threats that he wanted to kill his stepbrother and wanted him dead. He told his foster sister, I want to kill the five-year-old, referring to Logan. Mulligan's social worker, Debbie Williams, said the youth would swear at her and tell her to fuck off, but described it as more of a banter thing, though she acknowledged that he did sometimes go too far. 
Miss Williams said on one occasion the youth also called her a see you next Tuesday if you catch my drift. Okay, so the next little bit that I'm going to talk about is a little bit upsetting. It's uh, we're talking about the punishment and the mistreatment that Logan received at the hands of those three individuals. Okay, so now I'm going to go and get into some of the specifics about what Paul Logan had to endure. I apologise in advance for anyone who this might affect badly, but believe me, I feel really shitty having to repeat some of this stuff. But let's delve into this together. There have been many different accounts that have been given of both Cole and his mother mistreating Logan, whether it was by subjecting him to draconian punishment or simply not reporting his injuries. There were many, many red flags during the run up to Logan's death. Speaking about Cole, Logan's grandmother, Claire Williamson, said that they had first clashed heads when Williamson was in hospital for some reason and she had been looking after Logan. She would take Logan to the hospital and Cole wouldn't want her to take Logan in to disturb Williamson. She said that she felt as though he was simply a two-year-old child who needed to see his mother. There was also evidence that Cole was racist towards Logan and it's well known that he gave him the name Coco Pop because of his skin colour. Prosecutor Caroline Rees QC, who spoke during the trial, said that Cole didn't like Logan and treated Logan unkindly and viewed him differently due to his long-standing racist beliefs. A friend of Williamson, Rihanna Hales, said that the couple were very strict parents and described an incident when Cole told her that he didn't like Logan. He apparently said that he would always love Williamson even if he didn't love Logan. Another friend, Jodie Simmons, met the pair in 2019 and said that she saw Logan being punished by the couple. On one occasion, she said that Cole was sat in the doorway and that Logan was in a push-up position. She said his arms looked tired and they were shaking. She says she clearly remembers them shaking and that he was upset, crying and had a runny nose. She said that she had been told that he had been naughty and needed to learn a lesson. She remembers Logan collapsing as he lost the weight on his arms. Cole simply told him to get back into position and that his time would start all over again. Logan simply followed the instructions. He was three years old at the time. Miss Simmons claims that she also witnessed an incident when Logan was refused takeaway food, apparently due to his behaviour. Cole had told her that he hadn't been good enough to deserve fast food. All Logan was given was Weetabix. Cole had made a comment on how tasty the food was, rubbing it in. I don't think I could say anything more other than that he's just one sick man. During this period, Miss Simmons said that she noticed a change in Logan's personality and appearance. She said he was withdrawn, had lost visible weight at the time, and that his complexion was quite pale. She also commented on how his demeanour was very down and quiet. She said how he was becoming more withdrawn because he was being punished all the time. He was always being sent to his room, being told off all the time, being denied things like cakes and confectionery. You know, the usual sort of things that all children love to have from time to time. Paul Logan never got any. In August 2020, Logan was taken to hospital by his mother having suffered what she believed to be a dislocated arm but when treated, it was discovered to be a fractured humerus. Williamson told officers she had tried to pop the arm back into its socket and had sent Logan to bed with cowpole the night before, but when he woke up in the morning, his arm didn't look right. In a statement to police, Williamson had said that she had decided to pop Logan's arm back in place herself. She said that she took a firm hold of Logan's arm, pulled it straight and twisted it back. She claims that she put it back in place and heard a click. Of course, poor Logan was in so much pain when it clicked back into place. She also claimed that at the time she thought she was doing the right thing by putting his arm back in place, but realised it was a mistake. 
She said that she felt guilty about it and was sorry she hadn't taken him to hospital earlier. Get this, she said that she had just made a bad call. A bad call is deciding on wearing a pink sweater instead of the blue sweater. I'm really keeping myself in check. Anyway, Williamson later called the police in January 2021 and claimed Craig had confessed to her that he had pushed Logan down the stairs and that Cole was the person who tried to put Logan's arm back in, but she had lied to protect him. Logan's social worker, Gaynor Rush, said Logan had suffered what was described as a burn on his neck from a bath type, but Cole later claimed Williamson had deliberately burnt Logan's neck with a hot teaspoon because he was, in his words, being annoying. One of the neighbours, Kevin Gorman, described hearing frequent arguments coming from his next door neighbours and that Cole was being the most volatile of the, of the group. He claims that in the weeks leading up to Logan's murder, that most of the shouting would be directed towards Logan. He claimed that Logan would get quite upset. Mr. Gorman also recalls an incident when Logan was made to stand in the garden while facing the wall in just his pyjamas and bare feet. He said that for well over half an hour, he would be made to stand facing the wall while they were sitting around drinking coffee and chatting. Another neighbour, Fred Witchell, also recalled how he would hear Cole and Williamson constantly arguing and described their tone towards Logan as aggressive and nasty. He said that they would use foul language such as stupid bastard towards Logan. Some of Logan's teachers also noticed a change in him, with one teacher, Miss Richards, describing how Logan was nervous after having swelled himself and asking for his clothes to be thrown away. She also noted that his stammer had become worse. They also noted how he had lost a lot of weight and had started to have dark circles on around his eyes. Now, as you can imagine, there was quite a lot going on with this family and that was even before Logan's murder happened. And because of this, social services had many interactions with the family on a number of different occasions. So this is gonna be the part of the story where I will tell you about just some of those interactions. So, pure, beautiful little boy that he was, he was placed on the Child Protection Register in March of 2021 due to the concerns surrounding coal. Social workers were expected to visit the family every 10 days and were also expected to be able to offer help to Logan and his mother. A social worker by the name of Miss Rush was assigned to the case, that is until she left her post a few weeks before Logan was murdered. She stated that during her unscheduled visits to Logan's home that the property appeared to be clean and that Logan was always well presented, clean and seemed to have plenty of toys to play with. Miss Rush also noted that Logan's mother appeared to adore Logan and seemed to only want the best for him. Now it's just my little old opinion here, but surely if you really wanted the very best for your son, then maybe think about getting rid of the piece of crap that you share your bed with along with his psychotic child. No, scrap that. Don't just think about doing it, actually do it. Then maybe you would still have a son that's not lying in a morgue. Sorry about that, but this sort of thing really does get to me. I promise that I'll try and keep my opinions to myself until the very end. So let me get back on track. The social worker did say that initially she found Cole to be very intimidating, but that her relationship with him and Williamson did improve over the time. Well, over the two weeks or so that she had the case, that is. Miss Rush did, however, express some frustration with Debbie Williams, who was Craig's social worker, as it seems she refused to share information about him or even work with her. Okay, so now I'm going to get into the events that happened during the last week of Logan's young life. And I'm really sorry if this upsets anyone. Logan's last week alive was miserable, lonely and isolated. He unfortunately had tested positive for COVID-19 
and so his mother and Cole confined him to his room, which was behind a barred gate. His bedroom windows and curtains were kept closed. Some had described his room as resembling a dungeon. His parents, and I do use that word with the taste of bile in my mouth, prevented him from interacting with the rest of the family. Not that that would have been any fun for him, considering the way they all treated him. For me, when I think of the way in which Logan was treated in the lead up to his tragic death, and in particular, the time that he had tested positive for COVID, I can only rage at the injustice when Logan was forced to face away from his family and stand facing the wall whilst they would bring him his food. He was being treated as though he were, I don't know, was some dangerous prisoner or something. I mean, that he was ordered not to even look at them just beggars disbelief. Of course, he claimed later that he wasn't told about all the issues Craig had caused with his foster families and that he wasn't told about all the threats that were made by Craig to kill Logan. Cole was awarded full custody by the courts and Craig was sent to live with the family on a permanent basis. Craig arrived at the family home on Monday, July 26th last year. Originally, the long-term plan was for them all to move into another place somewhere else in Wales where Logan would be forced to share a bedroom until they managed to get a bigger flat from the council. And knowing council housing lists, how they go, that could have taken a while. Logan was last seen alive by someone other than his murderers during a FaceTime call between Cole and one of his friends, Callum Williams, on July 27th. Mr. Williams said that he could see Logan in the background sitting on the stairs. At 2.51 p.m. on July 29th, 2021, there was apparently an altercation between Angie and Craig outside. Craig was said to have been hanging on to Williamson as she tried to leave the property. Witnesses described Williamson as being hysterical. Craig apparently stood in the gateway and was pushing Williamson back into the garden before she went back into the house. A neighbour, Mr Witchell, who saw the altercation, described Williamson as being hysterical and Craig was desperately trying to convince his stepmom to go back in the house. Later, Williamson had claimed that she had tried to leave the house after Cole and Craig had viciously assaulted Logan by punching him in the stomach and sweeping his feet from out under him to knock him down. At 1.45pm on July 30th, Craig's social worker, Miss Williams, had arrived at the property but was refused entry to the house on the grounds of Logan's COVID-19 diagnosis. She had remained outside speaking to Cole and Williamson who had asked her about the benefit money that they would be entitled to for about 20 minutes before she left. During her visit, she was told that Logan was up and down, but that there, there was no serious concerns to report. She briefly spoke to Craig, who basically told her she could fuck off. I said earlier that that part of the story was one of the hardest parts for me personally. Well, I think I might have been wrong. This next part is the actual hardest part of this horrific story. It was later revealed that Logan had suffered catastrophic injuries to his internal organs and to his brain. These injuries were so extreme that they were considered to be consistent with a fall from a great height or a high velocity road traffic collision. There were extensive injuries to the abdomen, including a lacerated liver, a tear to the bowel, and a devolving and a degloving injury in the addendum, which is part of the small intestine. The pathologist also found 300 millilitres, which is about 10.14 ounces of dark liquid blood in the abdominal cavity. He also suffered extensive bruising to the scalp and back of head and his brain had suffered significant trauma. There was hemorrhaging to the right side of the head and inside the skull. The neurologist, Dr. George Lamy, said that he believed that 
there was evidence of more than one brain injury and quite possibly more than one episode of trauma. Logan had also sustained 56 bruises, cuts and abrasions to his body, including a visible cut to his forehead. The injuries were believed to be consistent with blunt force trauma and a forceful assault. There was no evidence to suggest Logan had drowned and therefore it was proved that he had died before ever entering the water. Pathologist Dr. John Williams said that there was evidence of healing in some of the injuries which suggested there was a period of survival up to several hours between the point injuries were caused and Logan's eventual death. The injuries to Logan's brain were believed to have been caused a good 36 to 48 hours before Logan's death. The pathologist also went on to say that the severity of those injuries could be expected with a fall or a collapse and in, in the absence of a high velocity accident the injuries were consistent with a blow or blows, a kick or kicks or impact or impacts with a weapon. Also, they found a fractured collarbone which had been left untreated for several weeks and that parts of the bone were not quite knitted together. The cause of Logan's death was given as blunt force, abdominal injury and cerebral injury including brain swelling, hypoxic ischemic neuronal injury and traumatic brain injury. Pediatrician Dr. Deborah Stalker had said that Logan's caregivers would have to have been aware that Logan was seriously ill after sustaining the injuries and that he would have been suffering a significant amount of pain. If he had been conscious, she said that Logan would have been very distressed. Dr. Stalker also said that the injuries were highly indicative of an abused child having sustained thumps, kicks and stamps. But more shockingly, Dr. Stalker said that Logan would have likely survived hours rather than days, but had prompt medical aid been sought and he would have had an 80% chance of survival, but at the very least he would have received very strong pain relief. Throughout the search for Logan, none of the defendants ever gave anything away and they appeared genuinely concerned for the five-year-old, hoping he would return home safe and sound. This charade was later described as an elaborate performance. While police were at the flat, the sound of a tumble dryer could be heard. It was later revealed to contain items such as Logan's bed linen, which had been laundered to remove incriminating evidence. During conversations with many police officers, Williamson was described as acting erratically, hysterically and emotionally. At one point, she appeared to suffer a seizure. PC Richard Lee, who attended the home, said that she told Williamson that Logan had been found, but that he was unconscious. She asked the police officer to clarify what that meant. She was told that the she was told that he was unconscious and that their colleagues were trying to revive him. She had said at that point that she had watched enough cop programs and that she wasn't that stupid. Then she had demanded to know where her son was. She also said something along the lines of, he needs to be taken care of, he will be cold. Hypothermia will cause that, that's why he needs his blanket. Williamson was later notified by PC Lee that Logan was dead. She began wailing and suffered a seizure which caused her to collapse. During this time, Cole appeared silent but assisted Williamson following her collapse. PC Brian Cooper described Cole as being upset and said that he just sat on the floor rolling cigarettes. Craig was playing Call of Duty on Xbox. Upon attending the hospital to see her five-year-old son's dead body, Williamson was heard by the nurse saying how she had wished she had taught Logan to swim. She also asked the nurse why Logan was wet and upon being told he was found in the river, Williamson claimed that she had not been told that. She also appeared to be performing 
and giving attention to Logan's body, but only when the nurses were watching her. Speaking to police officers at the hospital, Williamson had told them that they should arrest her because she had failed to keep her son safe. DC Claire Edwards commented that even though she didn't seem to be wailing a lot and making the noises of crying or sobbing, that there were very little or no tears during her entire time that she was with her. After having spoken to the police, the nurses said that they had noticed a change in Williamson, describing her as being aggressive with a real nasty streak. It was also said that she began making a point of kissing Logan's forehead, but again while being observed by the hospital staff. A CCTV camera from a property in a nearby street that overlooked Logan's home was the key in unlocking the mystery of what happened to him. It showed Cole and Craig illuminated by security light leaving the house at around 2.43am. Cole appeared to be carrying an object which looked like a cross on his back. It was later identified as the arms of Logan's lifeless body. They were then seen walking in the direction of a place called Pandy Park, then following the path along the river before they dumped Logan's body like fly-tipping rubbish in a spot near a sewage pipe and a railway bridge. After Cole and Craig had left the house with Logan's body, the light in Logan's bedroom could be seen being switched on and off by Angie. I don't know who it was who saw this, but I'm guessing it was a neighbour. At 2.44am, the curtain in Logan's room was partially opened by Williamson, causing the light from inside the room to shine brightly. The light was seen switching on and off between 10.09pm and 3.31am. When the stepfather and his beloved stepson returned to the house at 2.51am, they were seen leaving again at 3.16am, heading towards the direction of the river to dispose of Logan's ripped dinosaur pyjama top in the woodland before returning to the home again at about 3.27am. Now we're going to come to the forensic and telephone evidence. Logan's Paw Patrol pillow a duvet and a mattress protector were recovered from his bedroom and were found to contain small patches of blood staining. When the blood was analysed, it had a DNA sample which matched Logan. On August 4th, a search was carried out amongst the woodland near Pandy Park when a pyjama top that belonged to Logan was discovered near the embankment next to the A4063. It was a multicoloured dinosaur pyjama top which had been ripped into three pieces. On the night that Logan's body was dumped, there was activity on Williams's phone, including the watching of YouTube videos related to Dr. Pimple Popper, makeup, BNWs, pain management, and the cleaning of a big long toenail. Now these findings completely contradicted Williams's assertion that she had been fast asleep on the night that Logan's body was removed and dumped. Analysis of her mobile phone prior to July 30 showed a pattern of YouTube videos being watched linked to people popping, with videos of that nature being watched more than 300 times. Cole Williamson and Craig were all arrested on suspicion of murder at 6.20pm on August 1st at their home. The reactions of the killers differed dramatically with Cole quietly resigned to his fate, with Williamson again breaking down and wailing melodramatically, and Craig, a 13 year old boy, acting aggressively. Upon being arrested, Cole just started breathing heavily. He was told by officers to calm down and he was taken to Cardiff Bay Police Station. Williamson began crying and remained sitting at the bottom of the stairs. She claimed that she hadn't done anything wrong repeatedly. When she heard the commotion upstairs where Craig was being arrested, she shouted, Craig, you've done nothing. 
She then asked if the press were present outside before asking to leave. While being taken to the police, Williamson is reported to have said something like, I have just lost my son. This is tearing my heart apart. We need to find out what happened to Logan. When he was arrested, Craig said, get the fuck out of my way, get the fuck out of my way. While he was in police custody, Cole had told a prison officer that his stepson was responsible for killing Logan. He said, the thing is, I didn't kill Logan. I heard Craig reciting a rap song saying, I like kids, I like kids, I want to punch and kick them. He also said that he had a moral dilemma. Does he go down for murder or protect his son? What a great dad. Williamson was remanded into custody and she was taken to HMP Eastwood Park, which is in Gloucestershire. While in custody, there she told a prison officer that her partner beat her son and that she was trying to deal with it herself. A fellow inmate called Joanne Brooks said that Williamson was acting strangely in prison when they worked on the same cleaning team, claiming that the killer was going by the name Angie. Anyway, Miss Brooks said that Williamson asked if she knew who she was, if she had heard of her. Of course, she hadn't heard of her and didn't know her name or anything about her. Apparently, she basically told her why she should know who she was. She asked a fellow inmate if she had heard of the Bridge End baby, the boy who was murdered and thrown into the river, and that she was his mother. Miss Brooks said that it was like she was telling her what she had brought from the shops. She, she said that she was in there for her own protection and that she had been offered an identity change, but she had decided against it. Williamson apparently had told a lot of the other inmates that she would be proven innocent and after she was charged with murder, get this, she called the women on her wing to a meeting. It said that she stood at the end of a table and announced that she would be in charge with murder of her son and then went on to ask if the other woman would support her because she was going to prove her innocence that she did not kill her child. Later that evening, she was seen watching Married at First Sight, Australia, in her cell while eating snacks and laughing. Craig, on the other hand, made a number of inappropriate comments following his arrest while he was placed in care. He was heard by one carer saying, I love kids, I fucking love kids. I love to punch kids in the head, it's orgasmic. He also told another care worker, I did some bad stuff, but I'm not allowed to talk about it. On another occasion, he was heard shouting, where are the kids? I want to kill all the kids. He also told one care worker, if you knew what was going on in my head, trust me, you don't want to know. He later said, I ain't letting my dad take the blame, no way. I might just plead guilty next week. During his police interview, Cole claimed that he was woken up by Williamson, who he claimed told him that Logan was dead from a freak accident. He said that he woke up to Williamson screaming, he's dead, Logan's dead. He said that Logan was lying on his back with his head to one side in a weird position. He said that his eyes were wide open and that when he tried to move his head it, that it flopped and there was no response. He also claimed that he tried to perform CPR and blew into Logan's mouth and held his nose. He said that there was no pulse. Now he claims that he did this for ages when in fact he did it for 10 to 15 minutes. Williamson was frantic and hyperventilating. He said that he was desperate to save him. He said that eventually he stopped. He also added that he didn't hit him in the tummy and didn't see Williamson hit him in the stomach. He said that Logan had been jumping around all day and that it had been a difficult day. This is a direct quote of something that he told the police. Both of us grabbed him and took him into the bedroom. I wish to make it clear I don't know what happened, if anything, after I fell asleep at midnight. He said that he didn't believe Williamson would have hit him. He did say that they were both guilty of getting frustrated with him and grabbing him and smacking him. He claims that Williamson smacked Logan earlier that day but had missed and caught Logan on the trick. 
He also told police that after dumping Logan's body that Williamson had told him to get rid of Logan's ripped pyjama top, which he dumped in Woodland. Now, before her interview, Williamson was informed that there was CCTV footage of Cole and Craig removing Logan from the house. So, during her interview, she ran with this and kept on repeating how she felt conned, so conned, that she wished how she had never met Cole and his son, and how they had ruined her life. She even later said that she didn't want him anywhere near her ever again. In the fifth interview that she gave police, she changed her story and went on to claim that Cole and Craig had attacked Logan on July 29th, which was two days before Logan's death. Before this, she had denied having any knowledge whatsoever of how Logan's injuries had been caused. She said that Cole had punched Logan in the stomach. She said that she thought Logan was okay. She claimed that Cole had hit Logan a couple of times in the stomach because he wouldn't talk. When she had insisted that he stop, that he was being too harsh, she claims that Cole had said that the only way Logan understands is through pain. A freaking five-year-old boy only understands things through pain. What the absolute hell? She also added that Cole was in the SAS and that he would have her killed. He had told her that he was part of the SAS and that his family had connections everywhere. She said that he had said that his parents were founding members of the SAS. Of course, none of this was even remotely true. Williamson claimed that he had said that she couldn't leave him and that if she did leave because of Logan, that he would kill him. She said that she was terrified of him and that she saw him punch Logan in the stomach in the hallway which had sent the little boy flying. She claims that was how he had gotten the carpet burn. She also claimed that Craig had swept Logan's legs and punched him to the floor with the encouragement of his father. She maintained the entire time though that she had slept throughout the night of July 30th and morning of July 31st and claimed the lights going off and on in Logan's bedroom were in fact the security lights outside the property. She claimed that she would not have woken up during the night because she was on medication that knocks her out. In his police interview, Craig denied being responsible for causing Logan's death and claimed that he thought his father was fly-tipping rubbish when he followed him to the riverbank. He said that Williamson was up during the night and described her as acting hysterically, but when he tried to enter Logan's bedroom, he was prevented from opening the door. When he was asked why he didn't mention any of this in the first interview, he said the reason was because he thought it was a dream. He denied Williamson's claim that he and Cole attacked Logan days before his death. At the end of his interview, when asked if he wanted to add anything, Craig said, you can tell my mum to fuck up for me. She's blaming me and dad for everything and we haven't done anything. I'm sick of this and she's saying what she wants to get out of the fucking cells. The trial began at Cardiff Crown Court on February 21st, 2022, when prosecutor Caroline Rees, QC, opened the case by saying that it was the prosecution's case that Logan was murdered and that each of the defendants in the dock played their part in killing the five-year-old child who would not have stood a chance against any one of the defendants, let alone three of them together. She went on to say that the prosecution says that having killed Logan behind closed doors in the family home, each of the defendants played their part in a cover-up of the true circumstances of his death. Each of them were desperate to cover up their involvement in Logan's killing and that they prioritised their own self-preservation over everything else, but particularly over the needs of Logan. On April 21st, 2022, after hearing two months of evidence, the trial finally concluded when Cole, Williamson and Mulligan were found guilty of Logan's murder. Upon hearing the verdicts, Williamson gasped and collapsed to the floor 
At the end of the hearing, she was held back by a dock officer as she directed vitriol at Cole, shouting, You lying mother effing murderer, you lying murderer. Her two Cove defendants remained emotionless as the verdicts were returned. Williamson and Craig were also found guilty of perverting the course of justice. Cole had already pled guilty to that charge ahead of the trial. Following the verdicts of the jury, a gathering of an estimated 50 people came knit together near a bridge in Sarn. More than a hundred teddy bears had already been laid there in memory of little Logan, along with many floral tributes. It was a sombre atmosphere as those who attended embraced and shed a few tears while candles were lit and people observed the tributes which had been left for Logan Mwangi. In a particularly emotional moment, those gathered at the scene broke into a round of applause which saw everyone at the scene join in unison. On June 30th, the defendants were sentenced at Cardiff Crown Court. John Cole was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 29 years. Angie Williamson was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 28 years and Craig Mulligan was sentenced to life detention in a young offenders institute with a minimum of 15 years. Mrs Justice Jefford lifted the reporting restrictions which had provided anonymity to Craig Mulligan on the grounds of his age and his identity can now be reported for the first time. In her sentencing remarks, the judge said that to see the injuries on a small defenceless five-year-old is nothing short of horrifying. She went on to say that what happened to Logan must have involved appalling mental and physical suffering and that it's impossible to imagine the terror of a five-year-old child as these injuries were inflicted on him in the presence of his own mother. Throughout his short life, he was cruelly beaten by his mother, stepfather and stepbrother, kept isolated from the rest of his family, punished severely on a nearly daily basis, called cruel names by the very people who were meant to protect him and then ultimately murdered in his own home before being callously dumped in a river like fly-tipped rubbish. I've always been a staunch believer in everyone having equal rights but more and more when I come across cases such as this one I find myself believing that not every man and woman should have the right to become a parent, especially when it comes to the two people who play a major role in today's story as parents. Yes, I know that you can't always tell how someone is going to shape up as a parent, but let's take John Cole for example. With the criminal history that he had alone, it should have been a barrier to him being able to take full custody of Craig Mulligan. I mean, he wasn't even the boy's biological father, yet the courts decided that it should be him who should take on the responsibility of a child that obviously had his own set of problems. Do I have solutions to this particular problem? Hell no. Unfortunately, I don't. However, Maybe a starting point could be some sort of formal test that people have to take. Would it work? Who knows? But it could be a start. Now, Logan's mother, Angie Williamson, she could possibly have done with some form of parenting classes. And if only somehow she was able to have made some smart decisions, such as when to bring new men into your children's lives, she had already had two major relationship fails, one being the one that she'd had with Logan's father, Ben, and then the second being her failed marriage to a woman beater. Then she seems to have come up third time unlucky with John Cole. Perhaps if she had had more self-esteem and maybe self-awareness of her failings and she didn't feel the need to bring just anyone into her son's life, then maybe Logan would still be with us today. It would seem that the best relationship that Logan enjoyed was with his grandmother. And it would seem as though Angie allowed Cole to control the narrative and before too long, contact between Logan and his grandmother was terminated. It seems that Cole was aware of his own shortcomings 
and knew that Angie's mother could see those flaws and shortcomings. Therefore, the need to terminate all contact with her seemed inevitable. And as for the telltale signs that there were major problems within the household, well, not only did teachers become alerted to problems, but they seemingly did not raise the alarm. The same with the social workers that were involved with the family. I mean, for the most part, they seemed to completely ignore all the signs, turning a blind eye to all the red flags that showed themselves. Even when some of Craig's former foster parents tried to alert the social workers to their concerns, they did absolutely nothing. It is absolutely heartbreaking that this lovely little boy could have been saved if only the right people took some kind of action other than turn a blind eye and actually did the jobs that they were paid to do. I was absolutely sickened to my stomach after having read the autopsy report and when you realise the specific injuries that were inflicted on a human being and then suddenly you remember that those injuries were inflicted upon a five-year-old toddler, I'll admit, I cried my eyes out. I couldn't help myself. It was so upsetting. And yeah, it took me a while to get through it all. Logan was the helpless victim of a campaign of abuse. I mean, his injuries could have been compared to that of someone who, who is a victim of a high-speed crash or someone that had fallen from a very great height. Totally unbelievable that other humans, one being a child themselves, could do this sort of thing to another person. I absolutely will not take away from the fact that Williamson, Cole and Mulligan are completely responsible for the heinous murder of a five-year-old Logan Mwangi. The way that they eventually turned on each other after they'd been arrested was purely poetical. But like I said earlier, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the incompetence of the social workers. And the teachers, as good rules as they were, who could see the signs and were totally aware of the problems within the family unit, but yet they did nothing to remove Logan from the dangers that lurked within. Well, there you go. What did you think of what happened to poor Logan Mwangi? Thank you for taking the time to watch this here little video. If you did enjoy the video, then please do me a favour and hit the like button. And why not leave a comment down in the comment section. Tell me what you thought of this case. Also, why not let me know of any true crimes that you would like me to cover on this channel. And if you haven't already done so, why not subscribe to the channel turning your bell notifications on so that you know each time a new video drops. So, until the next video, thank you once again for watching this one, and please take good care of yourself. Bye-bye.